right. You can slowly wrap up your conversation. All right, well, that was fast. That's good. So, welcome. We had a, a little break last week with Father's Day. I hope you enjoyed time uh, with family. I hope you enjoyed the donuts. I know I did. But uh, welcome back. We have Bibles on the tables for you, so feel free to, to use one of those. If there's not enough Bibles on your table, you can grab one from another table or from the, the cart in the back. We are uh, still making our way through the book of Acts. So you can turn to Acts chapter 1. We're going to be in chapter 4 today, but I want to, since we had a, a break last week, I want to bring us up to speed uh, so we know where we are. But before we do that, let me pray for us. Father Almighty, we thank you for this day that you have safely brought us into. We thank you that we can gather together here as your people. We thank you that you have spoken to us through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his life, death, and resurrection. We thank you, Lord, that by the working of your Holy Spirit and your apostles, that you called and set apart that they wrote down these words and recorded these events as eyewitnesses. And we thank you that we can be here thousands of years after these events, looking at them and seeing how you still are a God who works. And so despite or regardless of how we're coming into today, Lord, whether we've had a great week or we've had a horrible week, whatever anxieties or fears or joys that we may be facing or feeling right now, Lord, I pray that you would help us to settle in and hear you speak through your word. And may all we do here today, both here in this time and also in our time of worship, be pleasing to you. Through Jesus, amen. All right, so Acts 1 through 4 in two minutes. So first of all, Acts chapter 1, if you recall, uh, Jesus is, well, first of all, remember that Acts is volume two of Luke's, I want to say trilogy because I love trilogies, but I don't know what you call two volumes. It's not a trilogy, but uh, Acts two volumes. So his first is obviously the gospel that he writes, uh, recording and walking uh, in the footsteps and in the life of Jesus. So in Luke, we follow Jesus's life in Acts uh, in many ways. Uh, we follow the life of the church as Jesus, through his spirit, his emissary, leads the church out into the world. So we follow Jesus through Luke and then Acts, we start to follow the church as Jesus goes with us into uh, the world. And we've talked a lot about how uh, in Acts chapter one, you have these these circles that kind of go out. You have Jerusalem and Judea, then Samaria, then to the ends of the earth. That's the promise that Jesus gives. And so in Acts chapter 1, remember, before Jesus ascends, he gives two promises to his disciples. He says, first of all, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, who he had been talking about even before his, uh, his crucifixion. You can go to John chapter 13 through 17 and read that account where Jesus is constantly talking to his disciples about the helper, the Holy Spirit that he's going to send. And right before he ascends in Acts chapter 1, he says, I'm going to send uh, the Holy Spirit who's going to come and give you power. That's the first promise. And the second promise is you will then go and be my witnesses to Judea, Jerusalem, to Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. That's quite a promise. And then we see in Acts chapter 2 that that promise was mostly, I mean, it was fulfilled, and there's sort of an already not yetness to the, the witness part because we're still today witnessing to Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. But in Acts chapter 2, we have Pentecost, and we looked at that for a couple of weeks, if you recall, where the Holy Spirit comes upon the people, and Peter stands up, and he gives a bold sermon explaining to them that this is in fulfillment of Old Testament scriptures, that this is what God spoke through not only Joel, but also through David. And in Acts chapter 2, we have the fulfillment of those two promises. We have the Holy Spirit since, comes upon his apostles, and then they go out and they begin witnessing Peter. The one who denied Jesus three times is now the one who's taking the lead, leading the charge and speaking boldly as a witness to Jesus. And the only explanation that I can come up with is God fulfilled his promise, sending, giving his Holy Spirit to help him do that. 
Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47 then, because this culminates the fulfillment of these two promises of the Holy Spirit coming and them being witnesses, culminates in, if you recall, God adding to their number 3,000 people in one day. Now, this is a church administrator's nightmare, but it would be really exciting. I mean, it would be really exciting, wouldn't it, to show up one Sunday and 3,000 people are here? I don't know what we do with them, but that's what's going on here. God is, is pouring out upon this community. He adds to their number 3,000 souls, and then we get this summary of this early church, verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's orthodoxy. They devoted themselves to fellowship. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And look at verse 43, because this is going to be helpful. We're going to see this show back up in chapter 4. And awe came upon every soul. And awe, wonder, came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling uh, their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. That they took care of one another. And day by day... Attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So that's the summary of this early church being formed because God fulfilled the promise. Jesus fulfilled his promise, sent the Spirit. They were witnesses. God added to their numbers. Then in chapter 3, Jake led us through two weeks ago, we saw this sign and wonder that's being performed. That's what was promised, right? Awe came upon them and all these signs and wonders were happening. And then we have a kind of a flash forward into the, this is going to happen in real life, in real time, as Peter and John are going to the temple. Because again, we were told that they were going to the temple day by day worshiping. And so they're going to the temple day by day to worship. And there's this lame beggar who's been there. For many, 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 many years. And remember, he asked to be, uh, he asked for, he's begging. And Peter says, I can't give you, uh, you know, money here, but I can give you something better. He says, get up and walk. Now just pause there and ask yourself this question. Not, this is not for out loud. This is just for you to think about for two seconds before we go forward. How would you respond if you observed this event? A guy that we, we find out later in Acts uh, chapter 4, he's been there for many, many years. I think Jake pointed that out. He's in his 40s. He's been lame. People know him because he's always begging in front of the temple. And Peter and John say, rise up and walk. How would you respond? Again, just, this is for you to think. And I want you to think about that because what we're going to see in Acts chapter 4 is a series of responses. And that's all I want us to do for the rest of our time is I want us to look at chapter 4. We will go back to chapter 3 a little bit. And I want us to ask and, and observe the different kinds of responses to that event. That's what chapter 4 is all about. It's showing us that there's multiple responses to the beggar being, the lame beggar being healed. I'm going to read not all of chapter 4, but I'm going to read chapter 4, 1 through 22, and then we're going to talk about these responses. And as we go through, be asking yourself, observe, what are the responses to that event? Because that's what chapter 4 is all about. All right, you ready? Look at chapter 4. And as they were speaking, that is Peter and John, as they were speaking to the people... The priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed, because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many, going back to chapter 3, but many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family, i.e. all the important people. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? 
Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that notable sign has been performed through them as evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must be judged. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. So different responses. The first group of people that I want us to, to, to see in their response are the people's response. We actually have to go back into chapter 3. So flip over to chapter 3, look at verse 8 is where we'll pick up. So the lame beggar, this crippled man who's, who's older than 40 years old, so he's been in this state for a long time. Everybody knows who he is. He's just been healed. There's no denying that. And this is what we see in verse 8 of chapter 3. And leaping up, it's not just he didn't just stagger up. He leaps up and leaping up, he stood and he began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Now that's a response, right? He's thankful. He's grateful. That's where gratitude comes from. When God does something in our life that's gracious, the right response is gratitude. And that's exactly what we see here. So he's grateful. He praises God. And look at verse 9. And all the people who saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So what's the people's response? You can talk back here. What's that? They were filled with wonder. Wonder and amazement. Right? They, they see something happening, and they respond saying, this is out of the ordinary. This is out of the box. Seeing a, a person who's clearly not been able to walk for his whole life, getting up, and not just getting up, but leaping and praising God, the only proper response, at least in the people's mind, is awe, and wonder. Then look down at verse 4. There's another uh, note that Luke makes for us about the people, this general group of people that responds with awe and wonder. Verse 4 of chapter 4. But many of those, referring back to that group of people, many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Because remember, after Peter and John, they, they say, get up and walk. The guy gets up, he leaps, he's praising the Lord. The people are amazed and in wonder. And then we read the rest of chapter 3. Peter then explains to them what's going on. Right? This is God doing this. This is what God has promised to do through his Messiah. He's the one that's active and powerful and working. And so that's the word he's proclaiming. And then in chapter 4, verse 4, we read again that those people who heard the word, they believed. So awe and amazement, then they hear the word, and then they respond with belief and trust that this word is true. So that's the process of the people. And it's amazing to me because as I was reading this this week, and 
This is why I ask the same question is, is how do I respond when I see God doing something amazing around me? Do I respond with the same kind of wonder? And if you take time to notice, and I don't, I don't do this enough, even though we, live, we do live in a broken world, there's no doubt about that, we also live in a world that has so much wonder about it, so much beauty about it. And it's really easy to go through life, and again, I'm speaking, this is autobiographical. I don't know if this is the rings true for you. But it's easy to go through life with sort of blinders on. Like, I just got to get to my next thing that I'm doing. Just got to get through next week. Just got to get to my vacation. Just got to get to the next thing I have to prepare for. Just got to get this thing done. And it's easy to go through life with blinders. And then what makes it worse is then we go to, uh, you know, our, our, our phones that constantly have notifications saying, well, this is happening in the world. And this is happening in the world. And it's always negative, right? It's like, there's got to be some good things happening in the world. But it's always the notifications that everybody clicks on is the negative things. And, and then you just keep going through. And if that's how you live your life, even as a Christian, it's easy to get worn down and to just start thinking that everything's just winding down, flushing down the toilet. And I think it's important as Christians that we don't live life with blinders on. We live life in light of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. God is active. He still is active. And yes, things are bad and things will get probably worse. But it's no different here. We're going to see, right? Things are pretty bad for Peter and John. I mean, they're, they're, being, they're being persecuted, as we're going to see here shortly. And yet, the response of the people is still wonder and amazement. So, do we take time to wonder at what God has done in our own lives? The second response or group of people, we'll spend a little bit more time with this group, are the religious leaders. And Luke sets this up like their response is almost the exact opposite to the people. The people were amazed and they were in wonder and awe. And we're going to see something else with these religious leaders. So, look at the beginning of chapter 4 again. Again, as they, that is Peter and John, were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Sadducees were just a, a religious group among the Jews. You had Pharisees, you had Sadducees. There's distinctions there. We won't unpack that today. It's not important for this. But, but it is interesting to note that you have these, these priests, you have the, the captain of the temple, and you have the Sadducees came upon them. And what does Luke tell us? Verse 2. They were greatly annoyed. They were greatly annoyed. Wait a minute. Did you guys just see or hear what happened? I mean, a, a lame, crippled man who's been that way his whole entire life is somehow walking. Now, whether or not you think Jesus did it or this was just some magic conjuring trick, you would still think this is pretty amazing, right? Like, like you should at least step back and be in wonder. But the first response is annoying. Like, well, this is ruining our day. This isn't what we plan for. Well, they tell us why, or Luke tells us why they were annoyed. Keep looking at that. Because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now, that makes sense to the Sadducees because the Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection from the dead. So that's why they would have been annoyed because they'd be like, well, that's not true. We don't really believe that. But the priests, this other category, they're annoyed because there's this proclamation about Jesus who's raising people from the dead. And you would think that actually raising somebody up, not from the dead, but raising them up to where they can actually walk would be a pretty good sign that maybe you should listen to what these people are preaching. Of course, they don't. And so in verse 3, we're told that they arrest Peter and John. They take them into custody. And then they question them. I, I love this. Verses 5 and 7. They ask them. After they get all these other important people in the room, right? They go out and get all the religious leaders that they need, all the, the higher ups, you know, um, and they, they get them in the room. In, in, in our form of church government, ecclesiology, this would be like getting all the bishops in the room, you know, and bringing uh, Peter and John in front of them. And they ask them a question. By what power or by what name did you do this? And Peter and John, they don't back down, right? 
They just call it like it is. Why? Thank you for asking. <laughs> Jesus. They keep going then after they question him. This is what's really pretty interesting. And this happens a lot of times in these kinds of moments of persecution. When, when, uh, especially when religious leaders get involved and they don't like what you're, what you're doing. Uh, they will question you, but then they acknowledge the reality. Don't they in this text? That's kind of strange. They actually acknowledge it. They, they realize we can't deny that this guy's walking. You can see this in verses 13 through 14 as they're kind of playing with this. They can't deny that this guy's walking. There's nothing you can say. You can't be like, well, no, he's not. Or this is some figment of your imagination that you just created. Or, or, or this is a magic trick. Well, well, clearly it's not. And clearly the people don't think it's a magic trick. They're in amazement and wonder. And these religious leaders know that. They know that their constituency, you know... Uh, believes that this guy was raised. They don't want to make the people mad. And so they kind of play this game where they acknowledge the reality. They were astonished at Peter. And that's a, they, they kind of move to amazement, but notice they're not amazed. They're not amazed that a guy literally is now walking. They're annoyed by that. They're amazed that some people like Peter and John who aren't educated are actually the ones who commanded this to happen, and are proclaiming to people about Jesus so eloquently. And, and they can't wrap their minds around that. That's where their amazement is, which again, kind of seems like you're missing the point here. You should be amazed and wondered at the fact that God has shown up powerfully to raise this person up as a testament to resurrection life, that, that he's no longer crippled, he walks, because Jesus is alive. And instead, they focused on the words of the people of Peter and John and said, wow, isn't it amazing that these guys are uneducated? I mean, we have all the, we have all the seminary degrees and education here. I mean, we're the ones that get to wear the cassock. They didn't wear cassocks, but, you know. Just, we're the ones that have it all. Like, like this is amazing. Like, that, that they're actually the ones that are proclaiming these words. But this ma amazement is, we find out, is not genuine amazement, not like the people who are in awe and wonder over a work of God through Jesus. But these people, their amazement is simply an amazement at the fact that these uneducated men are actually sounding pretty educated. And so in verses 15 through 18, they clearly reject Jesus. Even though they acknowledged that something really happened. And this is what unbelief can do to people's hearts. I don't know if you've ever been around maybe a friend or a coworker or maybe a family member. And they just can't understand why you would believe in Jesus. They just, they just you know, if you talk to them and you answer questions and you, you, you pray for them and maybe you... It, it may, and what even makes it work? I mean, it, it's, it's easier when the person's just like, I just don't believe in it. I don't believe in God. I don't believe, you know, this is all just made up. And, you know, that's a little, it's not easy, but it's easier than the person who, who reads it along with you and says, oh, yeah, man, this is, like, Jesus really, he really lived. He was a real historical character. And, I mean, he's clearly amazing. <laughs> but they still, at the end of the day, reject him. That at least in my experience, is the most, um, that, that's the hardest one. And that's exactly what these religious leaders are doing. Verse 15 and 18, look at this. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men? For, what a, notable, for, for a notable sign has been performed. Again, they, they acknowledge it. Through them is evidence of all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. We have no proof to go against it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. You see how they're rejecting Jesus there? They're saying, don't speak his name anymore. That's where the real issue is. They acknowledge that this guy's walking. They don't really care how it happened. Their issue is they don't want the name of Jesus to be proclaimed anymore. That's where the real annoyance lies for these religious leaders, which is strange. These are the people that know and were trained in the Old Testament. 
They should be the first ones to respond with awe and wonder and joy. They should be the first ones to fling open the gates of the temple. I mean, remember, the curtain was torn in two when Jesus was crucified. They should have been the first ones to bow down to Jesus and to call out and confess with their tongues that he is Lord. And yet they're the ones that are resisting. They're the ones that reject him. And therefore, they reject Peter and John. I love how they uh, kind of give him a slap on the wrist. So after they uh, reject Jesus, they, they uh, release Peter and John, but they kind of do it with a little slap, like, stop doing that. Right? That doesn't really work, right? If you're a parent, you know this with kids. Uh, you tell them, stop doing that. Well, that's the law. The law is good. It's good to tell your kids to stop doing something if they're doing something that will bring harm to themselves or to others. But if you think that your word, stop doing that, has any power to actually bring that about in your kids' hearts, you are very naive. Some other power has to come to transform the child to want to actually obey the parent. We've all known those situations. I was one of these kids, actually, where the child on the outward level did everything right. All my teachers in high school thought I was a great kid. My parents, they knew more. They, 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 they knew me behind the scenes. They knew I wasn't a great kid, but they, they thought I had it mostly together because I would. I would show up and go to church when I was told to. I would put on the clothes and I would do the different things that my parents asked me to do. But inside, I was a mess. I, I rejected it all. Something had to come and transform me from the inside. And so even though, you know, the parents said, don't do this, don't do this. Well, when my parents were looking at me, did I obey them? Yeah. When my teachers were looking at me, did I obey them? Yeah. When the principal was looking at me, did I obey him? Yeah. But when none of those authorities were looking at me, what do you think I did? I didn't obey any of them. I did exactly what I wanted to do. I think as I reflected upon this, where the first group of people, I think the application was the question, do we wonder when God does wonderful things? As the church, we should ask that question regularly. Do we wonder at the wonderful things that God does? The, the, but this group of people, the religious leaders, I think the, um, the application to our hearts is that we should beware of religion for religion's sake. Religion is not bad, but religion is bad when it becomes primary. When religion becomes the thing that we uh, want to ensure stays the same, even to the point where God can't even break through. You remember the, uh, the, the account in Revelation 3 where Jesus, uh, he comes up to, I can't remember which church it is. I think it's the church of Laodicea. And, and uh, John tells us in his apocalypse that Jesus is knocking at the door. And through, you know, some people that has been interpreted as he's knocking on the door of our hearts. And, you know, I'm, you, you could go there. I don't think that's what is in mind in that text. I don't think that's necessarily a wrong approach. And so I don't want to discount, you know, the great work of Billy Graham and, and others who have used it in that way. But I think in the context, you know what, what Jesus is actually knocking on? The one who walks among the lampstands? He's walking on, or he's knocking on the door of the church. He's saying, hey, you guys are all in your building and you're worshiping me. But nobody's actually invited the one you're worshiping. And he's knocking on the door saying, let me in. And if you let me in, I will come and I will dwell with you. That's the promise. I had this experience with a church that I served. I was starting seminary in Jackson, Mississippi. And I it was talk about a cultural experience, a kid who grew up in the West, coming from Colorado, and now I'm in this very formal Presbyterian, the Associate Reformed Presbyterian. I didn't even know that existed. Presbyterians have all kinds of or all kinds of branches. 
This was the Associate Reformed Presbytery, and I was serving there. The pastor was amazingly faithful. His name was Charlie Carlberg. He is now an Anglican priest in South Carolina. But Charlie, he's just a good old Southern boy, and, uh, but he was faithful to the work. He loved Jesus, and he loved this little church, but this church was dead. I don't mean just numerically dead, but it was dead. There was some faithful people in the church. I remember Lois. She was a faithful lady. She, I mean, she, I, she, she ran a VBS, and I remember when I, I was assigned, I was a, a student assistant, and I was assigned to help her with VBS, and I went around the neighborhood and put flyers out. She didn't know it. And normally we'd have maybe 20 kids show up for VBS. That year we had 150 kids show up. And, and, and Lois, you would think maybe she would be, you know, like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? She was the most excited person in the room. But there was very few Loises in this church. You see, Lois responded in astounding amazement, wonder at what God was wanting to do with this little church called Mount Salus Presbyterian Church, which, by the way, doesn't exist anymore. But some of the people in the room, particularly some of the elders of the church, were just always annoyed when God was showing up doing stuff in that little church. It got so bad before. We, we, were, uh, we were only there for two years. I was doing a master's, and, and I would, then I was transferring back to another seminary in Colorado to finish up my MDiv. And, and so we knew we were leaving. But there got a point at the very end when we were leaving where Charlie, the, the lead pastor, he would come up to me before service and say, Brent, in the middle of the service, you're just going to have to get up and go to the back because the people now are locking the doors. After the, after the right people come through the doors, then they lock them because they don't want other people to get in. He says, you're going to have to go to the back and unlock the door and welcome anybody into this building. Well, after I left, Charlie stuck with it for a couple more years. He tried to be faithful, and, and he was. He was definitely faithful. But eventually, Jesus just kept knocking at the door. Charlie's Ph.D. dissertation was on Revelation. He studied under Burn Burn Poitras at Westminster Seminary. And he did a whole series on Revelation, and he warned them. He said, guys, Jesus is knocking at our door, and if we don't open the door, if we keep locking the door... Eventually, Jesus is going to blow out the lights. And two years later, talking to Charlie, this is actually what propelled him to go into Anglicanism. The door shut completely, and now that building is just an empty building. Beware of religion for religion's sake. I think one of the key indicators here is, are you a person who gets annoyed when God breaks through some of our expectations or our categories, or are you a person who is in wonder and astounded? God was preparing me in that little church. I didn't know why at the time. I was like, I don't know why. This was the craziest experience I've ever had. I have lots of other stories, by the way, about that church. But... Um, he was preparing me for another church that he was calling me to lead. It was the first church that I was called to be a lead pastor. It was a little church. I've told stories about this church in the mountains of Colorado. Hot Sulphur Springs Community Church. And we walked into this church. Uh, a guy at seminary, he somehow twisted my arm to come up and preach one Sunday. And I said, sure. It's two hours away from Denver. So I drove up there with my family. We walked into this church. There was five people. And I was like, uh-oh. This feels a lot like Mount Salus. But the thing is, is it didn't feel like it at all. We spent the morning in a little Bible study with these four or five people. I led the service with these four or five people. And yeah, there were some obvious issues. I mean, they had every chair that they owned set up in this church, going back to their nostalgic days when they were all in glory. They had 100 people that used to come to the church. They had every one of those 100 chairs set up for five people. And they did set kind of distant. They, you could tell that they had some issues going on among them. But when we walked away from that church on that, that morning, we knew this is not the same. This is not like Mount Salus. These people truly want to see God do something in this community. They just don't know what it is. And when God does do something in this community, yeah, there might be some pushback at times. But this is a group that will be astounded and will be in wonder. And so we eventually took the call to that church. Uh, I went up there. 
They had no money to pay to pay me. I was bivocational. We were there for close to nine, ten years, and God did wondrous things. I have lots of stories about that. I won't tell those. But he did wondrous things in that church. And he's still doing wondrous things. Uh, when I left to go to Denver to be ordained, uh, officially ordained in a denomination, I was ready at that time to go. I thought I was going to be Presbyterian and uh, ended up being Anglican. But um, uh, we helped bring the next person in, and that guy's still there uh, with his, his family serving that community. And so there's another example of a church that took the opposite approach. They flung the door wide open and said, okay, Lord, we're ready to go wherever you lead us. And yes, we're sinners and we will be, there were times where they were scared and I was even scared, <laughs> but we're willing to follow you into this little community. We're willing to follow you and to serve this community, whatever that brings. We're willing to proclaim Jesus, whatever that brings. And they did. And God added to their numbers day by day. If you want to see this, if you still don't believe me about this, beware of religion for religion's sake. In this account, this is your homework. And if you know me, you know I like to assign homework. Matthew 23. It's one of the hardest chapters in Scripture. Matthew 23. Jesus speaks some of his harshest words. It's called the seven woes. He speaks some of his harsher, harshest words. And do you know the audience that he's speaking to when he, he reserves his harshest words for? It's for the religious leaders. It's for the scribes and the Pharisees. And he speaks seven woes to the scribes and the Pharisees. Because Jesus, again, is calling them out, reminding them to beware of religion for religion's sake. To not elevate religion above God. So that's a, another response. A lot more can be said there. So we have the people's response. They were astounded. They were amazed. They were in wonder at the work that God had done in, in, in healing this lame man, uh, helping him leap up and praise the Lord. They were in wonder. You have the religious leaders who their response was they were annoyed. They admitted something happened, but they didn't want to accept it. They didn't want to believe that it was because of Jesus. And so they were annoyed, and they set themselves against Jesus by setting themselves against the disciples. And then there's the disciples' response. We've seen this all throughout Acts so far. They were faithfully bold. They were faithfully bold. Let me just show you uh, what they do. It, it, in case you're wondering if you can do this, well, you can't. But the Holy Spirit working through you can enable you to do this. And it's really simple. I mean, we, we have evangelism programs where, I mean, it, you know, those, they're good. The evangelism programs can be good because they can give you some tools. But it really is kind of simple. If you read Acts chapter 3 and chapter 4, there's really one message that the, the apostles are continually saying. Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's Jesus. It's the, it's, the, it's the typical Sunday school answer. When in doubt, when the Sunday school teacher asks you a question, just say Jesus. But it really is in many ways that simple. Look at verse 2 of chapter 4. We're told that the religious leaders were greatly annoyed because they, that is Peter and John, were doing what? They were teaching and proclaiming in Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. Jesus, you can be raised from the dead in Jesus. That's a pretty simple message. It's full of a lot of hope. Verses 8 through 12, look at what they say. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember, Peter's not doing this by himself. This is not Peter and all of his power and might and, you know, education to be able to answer all these questions. No. Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. He's no longer the Peter who's going to deny Jesus. He's Peter who is following Jesus faithfully and boldly because he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And he says to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, 
Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and God raised from the dead, by him, not by me, not by some magical word that I did, not because I'm some special guru who's been assigned to heal people or anything like that. No, no, no. It has nothing to do with me, but because of him, this Jesus is the stone. This is quoting Old Testament. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's pretty simple. It's pretty clear. Look at verse 13. Now when they saw, this is the religious leaders, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were, and this is the place where they are astonished. Remember, they're not astonished by the guy getting healed, but they are astonished that these uneducated men are being so bold. But why? Look. And they recognized that they had been with who? Jesus. Verses 19 through 20. This is after the religious leaders, even though they admit that something really happened, they have no evidence to disprove that this man was healed, they can't bring up any argument against it, and yet they still reject Jesus. This is what Peter says, verse 19, but Peter and John answered them. Oh, and this is when they also said, don't speak anymore in the name of Jesus. Stop it, right? Stop it. Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you, Rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. So again, they're saying, look, we know you guys are in the position of power as the religious authorities. You may think it's not right for us to be speaking the things we're speaking, but you know what? That's between you and God. We have to speak because this is what we've seen. This is what Jesus has done. And this is what Jesus continues to do. And so it's, it's, it's important to notice how really simple it is. They're just telling people about what Jesus has done in their lives and in the lives of the people around them. It really is that simple. And I'm, I'm struck by this because I think oftentimes we make this out to be much more complicated. We are called to simply share the message. That's it. And you don't have to be dressed up like me to share the message. You don't have to have a seminary degree. You don't have to have a title in front or behind your name. If you are a Christian, a follower of Christ, you have been given the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, and all you have to do is wherever he puts you and share the message. He will do the rest. Some people will respond in astonishment. Some people will respond in annoyance. We can't control people's responses. We can't make people be annoyed. We can't make people be astounded. That's their decision before God. We're called to simply share the message. The other thing I think is amazing about the disciples' response is at the end of this text, well, not quite at the end because we're not finishing this chapter this week, but it's, it's verse 23. I didn't read this earlier, but we're going to read it now. Look at verse 23. This is the second part of their response. So, so they get released. They kind of get the slap on the wrist. Peter and John said, nope, not going to stop speaking about Jesus, going to continue doing that. And then listen, uh, verse 23, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God, and they, they pray. So this is their response. They go back, and they give a report, and they pray. They say, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointing. That's Psalms 2 that they're quoting. And they're saying the Holy Spirit spoke through David to predict that this would come. That the leaders would rage against this message 
about Jesus. Look at verse 27. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan have predestined to take place. Look at verse 29. And now, Lord, this is our petition. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. I find this strikingly amazing. They have just gone through this amazing, wonderful experience. This guy is healed. They proclaim to the leaders. They, get, they, they face persecution from the leaders. They don't give in to the leaders. They say, no, we're going to keep doing this. The leaders don't do anything. They just kind of slap them on the wrist and say, well, stop it. We're not going to stop it. They go then to church, to these people, their friends, and they go right back into worship, and they pray. And they pray for more boldness. They say, okay, the threats are going to happen, but give us boldness so that this continues to happen. You, Lord, provide the healing. We will go out and give the message. And, Lord, we trust that you'll give the results. Do you see that? And then right after prayer, what do they do? Look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I wonder what would happen if, in, you know, an hour from now, when we're in our church service, if the Holy Spirit came and started shaking the place, what we would do. Would we be in wonder? Would we be in fear? Would we be annoyed? Maybe a little of each. But they were gathered together. They knew exactly what was happening because they were dialed in through prayer. That's what prayer does. Prayer is not just to get what we want, but prayer dials us into the one who can give us what we need. They were dialed in. And as the place was shaken, they knew exactly what was happening. This isn't an earthquake. This is God. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. And what we're going to see through the rest of Acts is this pattern, where God's people gather for worship and prayer so that they can then scatter for mission. And the mission is real simple. Talk about Jesus. You don't have to corner people but simply in the flow of your everyday life, talk about what God has done for you. Wonder and be amazed and be in awe and just talk about it. Just talk about it. And the Lord will do the rest. Some people will be annoyed by it. Some people will be amazed by it. We simply speak it. I have a few more minutes here. I just want to point this out because persecution is real. Just ask uh, Christians around the world. I've talked to Christians in India in particular. That's where God has taken me in the past. I've told some of those stories. But it's important to realize what true persecution really is. Because sometimes I think we can be confused. I think what we see here in this text, a couple things. First of all, true persecution rises only as a result of our proclaiming Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. This is important in our American context because I think there very well will come a place where persecution will continue to arise. I don't think there's any reason to think otherwise. Nations come, nations go. But what we have to understand is true persecution comes when we proclaim Jesus. Not our agendas, not our ideas, not our hopes, not what we think should happen. Jesus. It's exactly what the apostles do. They simply present Jesus. This is what he's done. This is what he's doing. This is what he says he will do. Take it or leave it. It's all about Jesus. And if you tell me I can't talk about Jesus, that's between you and God. I'm going to keep talking about Jesus. 
We will see that through the rest of the book of Acts. The second thing to realize about persecution, true persecution, is that it comes from all sides. It can come from within and from without. And oftentimes I think the best clue that somebody is really being persecuted is if they are being challenged by both people outside their tribe and people within their tribe. If you're only being challenged by people outside your tribe while everybody inside your tribe is saying, yeah, way to go, it's not real persecution. It might just be your message. But when Jesus is proclaimed as both Lord and Savior, and it's his message, not only will the world react and hate you, but oftentimes the world that resides in the church will react and hate you as well. Church history is a testament to this. This text is a testament to this. Where is all the persecution coming for Peter and John in this text? Is it coming from outside, from the world? This is where you're supposed to say something. No. It's coming from their tribe. It's coming from the religious leaders. It's coming from the higher-ups. That should cause us to pause. Jesus told a parable about the wheat and the tares. Not everybody who comes to church follows Jesus. Not everybody who goes to seminary follows Jesus. Not everybody who wears a cassock or an awl or a surplus, depending on your level of churchness, or a stole or a tippet or a chasuble or all the other things that I don't know what they call. I call them ponchos. Not everybody who dons these garments follows Jesus. And to think that that's, if that, to think that that's the case is to be naive. Real persecution doesn't just come from the people out there. It also comes from the people within. That's why this word, I, I don't like the translation world for the, the Greek word cosmos. Because cosmos, when we translate it as world, at least in my mind, I think the world. Like out there, and then you have the church. That's not what cosmos is in the Greek. Cosmos is any system or idea or person or event or just anything that sets itself up against God. That's the world, cosmos. And that can exist out there, that can exist here, and that can exist here. We're called to crucify that, to die to that, so that we can then live to what God has for us. I could say so much more about this, and much more needs to be said, but it, again... This is where it is actually kind of encouraging. I mean, it is, it's discouraging when you realize that, okay, maybe not everybody who comes to church is a Christian. But here's where it's actually encouraging, is the mission doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's called to go out and cross borders, right? Not everybody's called to go to Afghanistan or, or uh, you know, Africa or something like that. Not everybody's called to go and do work among the refugees just 10 minutes from here. Not everybody's called to, to go and... You know, do Billy Graham stuff. Not everybody's called to go to the coffee shop and, you know, have a conversation and in five minutes you have it to Jesus. We are all called to love our neighbors. And we are all called to proclaim the message of Jesus to the people around us. And I've heard story after story after story after story after story of faithful Christians walking with their fellow Christians church members, having conversations about Jesus, telling about what Jesus has done in their life and in their friends' lives, and people who have been in the church their entire life getting to a place where they say, you know what, I just finally got it, and I just finally came to know Jesus. I've heard stories about pastors. There was one guy who was going through ordination. And some of the other priests, the Lord laid it upon their hearts that they didn't think that this guy actually knew Jesus. And they started talking about Jesus. 
And they evangelized this person who's going through ordination. And in the ordination process, they didn't obviously let him go on to become a priest. But in the ordination process, he actually came to know Jesus. This happens in the seminary all the time. People think they know Jesus. They grew up in the church their whole lives. They know all the answers. But they didn't know the one that they were supposed to be following, the one knocking on the door. And so really, mission is just simply talking about Jesus wherever he has you. And he may use you here in St. Andrews. There may be somebody that God brings your way here in St. Andrews, and your, your job, your mission is to simply love that person, talk about Jesus to that person, pray for that person, and who knows, maybe God will lead that person to come to know them finally and finally. And the other final response here, so we have the people's response, religious leaders' response, disciples' response. I'll just say this and we're done. God's response. Don't miss God's response. In this text, Acts 4, the bottom line is this. God fills his people, he empowers his people, and he grows his people. God is the primary actor. And so the question that I leave us with is this. As we go to worship... Are we astounded? Are we in wonder? Or are we annoyed when God shows up and does something out of the box? Amen.